Hello and welcome to Guitar Night Live, episode 14. I'm here at Ultimate School of Music in Dunleary in Dublin, Ireland. And my guest tonight is a guitar player who I've been watching on YouTube and different websites for, for quite a while. And he's extremely impressive with his playing and many, many people are noticing that Okay, there's loads of good guitar players. Everybody knows that the world is full of great guitar players now, but we see his videos and there's something really different about them. He's really standing out above above the masses of guitar players. He's being noticed by players like Steve Vai and Al Di Miola. They're noticing this guy's got something. He's able to hear and absorb the influences of guitarists of the past from Django Reinhardt to Joe Pass and Alan Holsworth and make his own language out of all of this. And you can hear that he's adding something as well. He's not just copying people from before, but he's got his own language and take on it. I'm really, really excited and happy that he's here tonight. Please welcome everybody, Matteo Mancuso. Welcome, Thank Matteo. You. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm really fine, thanks. Great. So, Matteo, I wanted to first ask you, can you tell us a bit about how did you start playing guitar? What age were you and why did you start playing? Yeah, um, I stopped playing when I was about uh, 10 or 11 years old. I don't really remember, but um, it was around that age, yes. And I started playing uh, electric guitar. Uh, many people think that I started with the uh, uh, with the classical guitar because I play with fingers, but uh, I actually started with the electric guitar. And uh, my first guitar was a uh, was a Squire Stratocaster, uh, but the you know the the three four one, the smaller one, and um, that that was my first guitar because I was really into Jimi Hendrix and ACDC and Jimmy Page uh, that were my first influences, my kind of introduction. Matteo, I'm going to just stop you there for a sec. The uh, Go ahead, you were saying about Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, um, Jimi Hendrix was my basically my first big influence on guitar. And I think he's uh, still a big influence for me. And uh, it was my kind of introduction to chords and shapes, uh, you know, all the Jimi Hendrix stuff. You know, and um, I kind of learned all the riffs and uh, the first uh, songs that I learned. Actually, maybe it was uh, uh, one of the first songs I learned from Hendrix was uh, Foxy Lady, so everybody knows. So uh, that was my introduction to electric guitar. Then I started moving around uh, uh, people like, uh, you know, Angus Young and uh, Jimmy Page and Deep Purple, all the big bands from the 60s and 70s, all the big rock bands. Um, yeah, that, that was my introduction to this beautiful instrument. At that time, did you use a pick? No, I started with fingers and uh, I kind of, I started without nails because I have some nails on my right hand, but I started without it because I didn't even know that you can grow nails for guitar. So um, later on, when I started to study classical guitar, I learned about nails and how can you shape them in order to achieve a good sound. Um, so. I, I think that my first issue with the, this technique was the sound itself, because it was too muddy, it was too dark, and the pick has that uh, edgy, that uh, you know, bright sound that you need to have uh, in order to play rock or you know, blues rock music. And nails helped me a lot to achieve that sound. So I think if you want to go. 100% finger style on electric guitar, you need to have some nails. And uh, what kind of, how do you take care of your nails? Do you file them and I, anything on I, them? 
just um, you know send paper or you know this kind of stuff and i keep them very short so they don't make it too big and yeah i found myself better with short nails for electric guitar yeah have you is there any more gain on the mic you can put up uh, uh yeah yeah let's see or there it's perfect if you just stay that close ah uh, okay okay yeah i would go here <laughs> great so did you just naturally you just played with your fingers straight away just naturally yeah just straight away with my fingers yeah that's interesting and uh, what age were you when you started to play gigs uh gigs i, I think around uh, uh you know at a very early age because my father is also a guitar player so uh i used to game with him at some gigs and concerts and i've I think my first gig was around 11 or 12 years old. Wow, so that's early. amazing. What, did, what kind of music did you play then when you were 11, 12? Ah, you know, Hendrix songs, blues, basically. Cool. Uh, I, I think that uh, is the introduction for most of the players. And tell us about where you grew up. You grew up in Sicily. What was it like? Was there a big music scene there? Yeah. I, basically grew up in Sicily here in Palermo. Um, uh, I actually don't live uh, in Palermo, I live in a, in a small town nearby. Uh, so the music scene is not really uh, big here. So I, I think I, I, I'm one of the few young players here. So there aren't a lot of players, but there, there are definitely some good players here in Sicily. And uh, to name a few, I, I can think of, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a really good friend of mine that I think is an incredible guitar player. It's called Daniele Raciti. And uh, mm. he's kind of a rock fusion player. And uh, I like him a lot. He's, I think, one of the best here in Sicily. And, uh, there are also, you know, f famous players. Do, do you know about Francesco Buzzurro? No. Is uh, also a player from Sicily. He plays uh, um, plays classical guitar, but he plays arrangements, standards arrangements, and uh, he's, he's really, really good. You should uh, check it out. Great. We'll get some names off you, and we'll uh, we'll post them up so we can check them out. So, did you ever feel like you wanted to move somewhere with a big city and bigger scene and play more music, or have you felt like happy where you are? No, I'm. I of course I'm happy where I am, but I'm. You know, I I'm aware that there are uh, better places, uh, <laughs> and uh, you, you know, my I I think uh, Los Angeles w could be a really uh, good city because there is a lot of fusion guys there, and uh, that's kind of uh, the direction I want to take for my music. So, so you. Maybe a move to LA, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so it's interesting because in the past, if somebody wasn't there, then they wouldn't have been able to hear a lot of music. But nowadays we can hear whatever music we want to hear all the time. So it's, it's kind of like you've, you've had exposure to so much music. Have you? Yeah, yeah that, that's definitely a good advantage for my generation, of course. And I have to thank my father also for this because my father is also a guitar player and it kind of uh, introduced me to the jazz players because my father is a jazz guy. Yes. <laughs> uh, you, you know, uh, when I was young, he always told me, you should listen to Wes Montgomery, you should listen to Django. And <laughs> I, I kind of, I, I was more of a rock guy back uh, when I started, but, but when I was, uh, a younger like 16 or 17 years old i was introduced uh, thanks to my father uh, to the traditional jazz players like west django and barney castle also and uh, other jazz cats and uh, did your dad actually give you lessons and teach you jazz or yeah sometimes but um we we just uh, you, you know play together not just study together 
Uh, so uh, and I think it's a very good it's a good advantage if you have someone to play with in your house because you uh, you, you can uh, uh, try a lot of things. Uh, we, we actually have a duo together and sometimes we play standards. Uh, uh, that's a really good advantage if you have the chance. But we never really study together. We just study. I study my things. He studies his things. <laughs> That's great. It's wonderful. It's best way to learn is by playing, really. Yeah, yeah. So before I ask you another question, I'm going to put Mateo's PayPal.me link here in the in the chat window. So if anybody wants to send Mateo over some money, do that by PayPal for saying thank you for coming on and teaching us today. And uh, of course, any gigs that we used to have so many gigs and they disappeared for a long time. So that's been difficult for guitar players. So uh, if anybody has a question for Matteo at any point, you can either write it into the chat and I'll ask it, or you can put up your hand. There's a button to put up your hand and you can I'll unmute you and you can speak. So uh, someone asked Matteo, what is the black thing at the end of your guitar? Oh yeah, it's a fret wrap. I use it for, uh, you know, Tapping things, legato things to mute the strings. Uh, so it's a really useful thing when you're recording. Yes, it's just a string muter. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, another question came in Was part of your studies Slanimsky, the source of scales and chords? Have you studied Slanimsky? No, no, I, I don't know this book. Is this a. Uh, Book, yeah? Yes, a book. Yes, I haven't studied it either, but I know some sax players and stuff working off it. Oh. Some heavy theory stuff. So tell us a bit about the finger style technique itself now. When watching your videos, I can see that it's like you're using one type of one type of stroke on the single note lines, but sometimes then you're changing to more of a free stroke. It's like rest strokes and free strokes, but a little bit different from the classical way of doing it. It's, yeah, I basically use uh, um, uh, two different types of positions for the right hand. So this one is the, I think, more classical position with the free strokes. And I use it more for, uh, you know, wide arpeggios or just range intervallic stuff. And of, or for string skipping patterns, you know, things that uh, you have to do big jumps. And the other one is the this kind of bass technique, like, and uh, um, this is like the technique I use for uh, more close things on the fretboard. So if I have to do a chromatic line, like that, I would use this technique. If I have to do a like a bigger page, so I use the other technique. So that's basically sums it up. These two techniques. Cool. It'd be great to hear again examples. Your guitar is very quiet there. Can you get more volume? Yeah, let's see. Is it better now? Very quiet. I think it's the being. It is better now. It's very quiet. Let's uh, let's go again with the uh, trying to demonstrate the two different techniques, please. So um, that's a pattern that I use most of the time to, you know, like an exercise for the right hand. Uh, this is yeah. a, um, a for this kind of arpeggios up and down. I always use the um, classical technique, so without uh, appoggiato in Italian. Uh, so appoggiato is rest stroke, yeah, uh, and and tocco libero is a free stroke basically. So this is the free stroke. So uh, basically. Uh, 
the concept behind that is uh, that I'm able to perform all the arpeggio family with the same fingering with my right hand. So if I have to do a minor seven arpeggio, it would be like that, or a um, dominant seven. So and I always use the same um, order with the fingers. So I, I don't have to think about my right hand. I only have to think about the fingering on my left hand. And, and it's something I'm working on still now. And uh, I, I think that's the advantage of the fingers because uh, uh, when you do something like that with the pick, you have to uh, like sweeping or string skipping. And the problem with sweeping, I think for me, is that it's only a one straight up movement. So you you need to work on a lot on the rhythmic control of that movement. So if you if you are sweeping, you are probably playing arpeggios like that, and and that's okay. It's it's a pretty uh, you know um, fast arpeggio. But if you want to have uh, an you know, you, you want to start from different points during the arpeggio, something like that. Uh, you can achieve this with fingers by staying here. Uh, this is a pretty um, easy way to do it with fingers, but with the pick, you have to skip the strings and then go down and then go up again it's it's a really hard thing to do with the pick. So I think the the, the main uh, idea behind that is that the pick is easier on the same string, but fingers are easier on different strings. This is yes. kind of the rule uh, with that, I think. This makes sense. And is this something that you were taught when you were studying classical or did you come up with it yourself with the, with the seventh arpeggios? I think, of course, classical guitar helped me a lot to uh, achieve the, the control, uh, but I'm I'm not a good uh, classical player. <laughs> uh, I never studied uh, a lot because I was really into rock stuff. <laughs> I played uh, some uh, classical repertoire, so I never studied uh, seriously. Sure, then, just uh, some boring repertoire, but... <laughs> yeah, you know... I don't like it, I don't know. Um, and um, of course, there are, um, I think for most of the things I came up with my own thing because the classical way is different. I also use a different approach for the right hand. The, the classical right hand is slightly different than mine. So I, I think it's a really personal approach. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna, I think this will be useful for people who are interested in trying it if you show me exactly how to play this way just with one arpeggio just which finger which order how is it done is it will we choose a like a uh, minor I, seven yeah we can choose an a minor seven of course or, or also the the minor arpeggio i was talking about this is just a minor triad starting from uh, uh, fifth string with my pink so which which order is the right hand fingers in so the order is uh, um okay, I, I have to remember the you could say p i m a p i m okay so p i m a is very basic and here i i use the the two fingers uh, medium and index and then so okay right so p i m a m i p P I M A M I like that. Yes. So it's like you're going. 
Oh, right. That makes sense. That makes sense. That yeah, makes sense. I never, do, I never do that, like uh, index and medium. I always do this kind of tremolo thing. Going right. Up. Even if I'm starting with the medium, I always do this kind of tremolo stuff. And this is basically the, the pattern I work on when I'm uh, uh, warming up. Uh, there is only a pull off here. Yeah, and and then you have to uh, medium index A, M, I. A, M, I, P, A, M, I, P. So, oops. Okay. Oops. It's not, of course, a strict rule, you know, I change fingerings a lot depending on the line I want to play. So uh, sometimes I didn't even realize what <laughs> uh, what fingering I used. Um, and the hard thing with the fingers, I think, for me, is the are the patterns on the same string. So you know the famous Malmsteen pattern. Um, these are uh, really difficult things with fingers because you have, you have to, you need to be really precise, and uh, for for that kind of stuff, I mostly use this kind of bass technique. With are you alternating I and M or I and M and A as well? I I, I use all three, so uh, always uh, like the tremolo thing. Um, I. No, no, it's, it's the opposite. So like uh, um, A, M, I, A, M, I, okay. That's, that's very interesting because that's pretty different to like mostly, you know, when I was studying with finger salad guitar teachers, if we were playing lines, we'd be just alternating I and M back and forth. Um, I, it's, it's a bit more limited I, like that. Like, you, you know, for two two not per strings pattern it's okay yes uh, but, but you know i i found myself more comfortable be, with that because the right hand is more relaxed uh That's so great. I, I can you know play this kind of even if it's not incredibly clean but um you you need to have uh, um you need to have uh, short nails for that, I think. Uh, because if you have a longer nail than the other ones, you kind of get get stuck in the in the strings, and uh, it's not a comfortable way to play if you have too long too long nails. So, Matteo, the kind of speed and accuracy that you're able to play with. What, what did you do? Did you have practice certain exercises, scales and arpeggios? How do you approach practicing? How did you get the speed and accuracy? Uh, okay, first of all, I, I don't have a strict practice routine. I just grab the guitar and play what I want to play. And I concentrate on different topics depending on the day, of course. Sometimes I'm more concerned about harmony, sometimes rhythm, sometimes I, I just learn licks, I just, you know, uh, juggling things around and see uh, what I can do. Um, I, I think the, most of the time I learn songs and I, I think it, it's a very um, good way to improve your playing because Basically, um, we have to be good in three things, uh, and these three things are the the backbone of music, basically. So the, they are harmony, melody, and rhythm. And if you if you're learning a song, you basically learn all these three things because you learn to comp a song, and you learn some rhythm. You learn the melody of the song, and you learn the melody. And uh, of course, you have to know the chord progression. Uh, you learn it some harmony. Uh, 
this is one of the best ways to improve with guitar. Just learn the songs and go in deep with with the song, you know, not just to learn the muscular memory, you know. That's a great approach. Really, really great. So just for anybody who might have missed it, Matteo was saying to comp the song. If you weren't aware, comping is short for accompanying. So it's yeah, yeah. playing, being able to play the chords while someone else is playing the melody or soloing over it. So but, so you, you've been learning lots of songs. So you, you must have a big repertoire now. Yeah, kind of. I, uh, I, I learned a lot of songs uh, when, I, when I was younger. And of course, the first songs were not uh, uh, harmonically rich, you know, because I learned some, uh, I learned a lot of ACDC songs. <laughs> ACDC songs are just the first position. And you basically learned 90% of the ACDC repertoire. <laughs> of course, uh, I um, I learned some w when I got uh, when I had to learn some standards. Uh, there there is a big difference. So um, when I when I first learned the standard, I kind of understood better the, the geometry of 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 the neck and the guitar. So uh, one of the first I. I learned was uh, is in Shilovli, you know. Yeah. And you know, you, I basically uh, playing around the, the chords and just you know inventing some lines and and of course of course learn the melody. Uh, so I think that standards help a lot with this. Um, with this concept and ideas. Cool. And, and then transcribing, is uh, that something you've done a lot of learning solos? Yeah, I sometimes transcribe some solos, but only if I don't understand some harmonically lines, harmonic lines. So, uh, you know, I I recently go uh, got into some Michael Brecker stuff and uh, really uh, strange lines that I want to apply and uh, of course uh, we are talking about uh, some advanced concepts but uh, um, I think you, you only have to prescribe if some something is not harmonically, harmonically clear for you I think uh, because I, I'm not really into transcriptions uh, so I, I only prescribe if it is uh, harmonically interesting yeah, that's interesting, actually. Uh, did you see that recent, can't remember his name, but someone was playing the uh, a Michael Brecker solo on guitars, very good. Ah, yeah, the, um, yeah, I saw it. Simon, Simon someone. So that's really interesting about that. About halfway through, there's a couple of questions in, and then we might hear you play the piece Fred then. So yeah, question from, Fam Kong Ming, I don't know if I pronounced it right, but uh, you've seen him play, he learned to play your technique. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know him, yeah. He learned from watching, he's got I very... Saw, um, uh, Cliffs of Dover cover by him with yeah. the style technique. It's very good, yeah. It's very good, he just slowed the video down and watched you and just learned how to do it, it's amazing. So yes. uh, he, he was asking, have you ever tried to slap with fingernails? Have you tried that? Um, no. I'm, I, I'm really not interested in his life. I, I don't know why I don't like the sound, so. <laughs> <laughs> cool, that's a good answer. And uh, another question in from Mark Godino. What inspires you to make music? What inspires me to make music? Um, okay, what inspires me to compose is basically, you know, life experiences, basically, and, or, uh, you know, album albums that i love or sounds that i fall in love you know and you, you know most of the time when i'm making music i fall in love with a certain artist or player and uh, i remember the first time uh, i listened to alan osworth it was a big change for me 
and I was inspired, really, really inspired. It was one of my, uh, you know, mind blowing moments. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, most of the time when I'm composing some stuff, I I think about some uh, real life experience that happened to me, or or s maybe some artist that uh, I like a lot, uh, and I I'm, and I kind of want to make a tribute for him. Um, so th these are main the, the two inspirations I have for making music. <laughs> That's a great answer. I think it comes across when we hear someone playing who's not just playing something because they can, you know, they're playing something because they're, it means something real, something from real life that they want to play about and express something. I think that comes, yeah. comes through. So another question in there's a, when, when did you start playing? Okay, it was 11 or 12, but was it acoustic or electric, your first guitar? Electric. Oh, electric. straight away on electric. Stratocaster, yeah. And uh, did you start playing acoustic later on? Um, no, I, mm, I'm kind of, I sometimes play acoustic, but not too much because otherwise my nails are, will fall apart <laughs> ah, interesting. If, I play, if I play too much acoustic you know uh, so I only play right now I'm mainly playing electric guitar but sometimes I play also classical guitar um, do you when you play a gig do you find that you will like destroy the nails is it not like when you play a gig when you have adrenaline and you play harder do you not find that it's bad for the nails? That the first time was really bad for the nails, but I kind of learned how to play soft uh, in live situations. Um, so, uh -huh. of course, I consume the nails, but they are not destroyed. After yeah. It. So, uh, of course, uh, I take care of the nails before. Yes. And again, it's if they're too long, then they would just get ripped off. So, can yeah. you see how long are your nails? Quite not too long. Yeah, not too long. You can see it; they are very short. Very but short. Now they are they are long for me right now. Right. I have to, you know, shorten them a little bit, but this is the usual length I use. Um, and Fam again, he asked how. <laughs> I'm not sure how to hitchhiker thumb like yours. Your thumb can bend backwards. Your thumb can rest and mute the E string when using the bass technique. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, you mean when I'm comping? Yes. Ah, this is kind of just a palm muting stuff. I just place the the palm here, like, like you, you know, many bass players do that. Yes. Great. And, uh, oh, this is a good question from Pierre. When you learn, you're saying that you learn songs. So do you learn them by ear or how, how do you learn the songs? I mostly learn it by ear. Yes. Sometimes I slow down the piece maybe, but uh, I mostly learn by ear. Yes. Ah, that's a good question. Yes. A good way to learn by ear. So uh, let's hear the piece, Fred, and we'll come back to some questions after that. So keep the questions coming in. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself. Can you? Let's just do a little sound check before you play and make sure we've got enough volume. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is too loud. Maybe. Was good. Okay, I have to just adjust the volume here. Thank you. 
Believe me. Uh, we, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so, uh, so lots of comments coming in there from that. That is, is oh wow, what to say about that? My mind's thinking of a million things right now. <laughs> there's quite a few questions coming in, but uh, I wanted to, there's a couple I wanted to ask you. I don't want to lose the chance, but for a guitar player today, how important to you in your career is that you'll have a YouTube channel? Is that going to be like a part of your career that you're a YouTuber as well as, you know, Instagram and different social medias? How do you, how do you think it plays out apart from just gigging, writing music? How important is YouTube? And, you know, I, I think, uh, First of all, I, I don't consider myself a, a YouTuber or an influencer uh, <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, I, I don't like to use socials. Uh, I, I use social only because I'm a musician, so I have to, um, you know, let people know that I'm existing. So <laughs> I think social are a, a huge part of your curriculum now because uh, everyone if uh, they are gonna know you by your youtube channel your instagram page your facebook page and it became some sort of uh, you know um, like a presentation for your music and uh, um, for, for what you can do and what you offer to the people so it's kind of a hard thing to explain in English because uh, there are complicated concepts. Uh, but I think uh, for a musician now, I think that you need to have a YouTube channel, you need to have an Instagram page, 
just because uh, uh, you you can have a lot of uh, uh, distribution of your stuff all over the world so people are gonna uh, know your name not by not only by gigs and concerts especially in this period uh, with covid 19 sure uh, so I, I think it, it's important for for a musician is it's not important as a person because I always look at the, I, I, I always look at the social media stuff as work, not, uh, you know, things where, uh, um, not games. <laughs> I don't sure. know how to explain it uh, good in English, but. Uh, no, it makes sense. It makes sense. And so for your guitar career, what, what other goals do you have? Like, Someone asked, "Are you in a band? Are you going to record original music?" I, I I'm, um, I consider myself, uh, you know, I, I want to be a, an artist. So I, I think, uh, for, for me, the, the best way to express myself is uh, through my music and my ideas. And of course, I, I would like to work with other musicians, but I, I don't consider myself a. Uh, a touring musician, a, a touring player, like you know the uh, the studio guys like Luke Eder or Larry Carton, this kind of uh, guitar playing. And I, I think it's not for me. <laughs> I, I I'm more on the uh, artist way of things. Um, so yeah, I, I my goal is to be a 100% complete artist and. By that I mean uh, that I want to make my music. I want to have an identity as a, uh, an artist rather that's, than as just a guitar player. Yeah, that's that's a great goal, and, and we all hope you achieve that goal very soon. Thanks. Did you want to mention about original music you're planning to record and release? Yeah, I, I was planning to release a. Uh, an album by the end of uh, this year, but you know, COVID-19 retarded a lot of things. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to uh, record something with my trio. So um, I, I think uh, this album will be a trio based music. Uh, so we are currently working on a, a lot of originals. I currently have uh, like four, five songs written and recorded, but I, I want to uh, go up uh, like the eight, nine songs will be like perfect for, for an album, like not too much and not too good. Great. So how would we, how would we hear, how, if we want to find out about your album, how will we find out about that? Uh, I, I will update my my social media pages about that. So I oh. think the, the first thing I want to do is the, the website. Yeah. Uh, you know, the matteomancuso.com or something like that. Great. So I can sell the album on uh, yeah, that website. Great. So everybody can follow on, on the Facebook or look out for the website. And question from Lorcan, one of my students, Lorcan asks you, what's your favorite guitar? What kind of make of guitar? And can you? Stay close to the mic, please. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, um, my favorite guitar, is, I think, is this one. <laughs> uh, this is a custom Repstar. Um, it, it's very similar to the original Repstar model, the 820, but it has some uh, different specs. Uh, first of all, these, these are Lollar pickups, Lollar Imperial pickups, and uh, they are really good pickups, and uh, I just love the, uh, the full sound of the unbucker. So I always choose the, you know, kind of uh, less all like guitar. Uh, so my my first uh, like my first Gibson was the SG. I I bought yes. the Gibson SG thanks to Angus Young. Um, this as the you know, aggressiveness of the Gibson SG, but you can also play more jazzy stuff. It has a lot of, uh, uh, like, in-between sounds, like the crunchy tone or the other tones you want to have. And 
the, the great thing is that the, the selector here is a five switch selector. So you, you, you can use this unbucker as a, a single coil and also uh, this one. Ah, and so, so this guitar is made by Yamaha, right? Yeah, it's a Yamaha, yes. And, and Yamaha, did they approach you? Yeah, they approached me like three, like, yeah, three years ago. Uh, and they, of course, they were interested in making uh, like a custom model for me. This is like a prototype, it's not really a custom model. Right. Uh, but they like built, uh, I, I think, the, the, the perfect balance between the aggressiveness of the of the rap stars and you know the the sweetness of the of the clean sound so i i basically use this guitar for jazzy stuff and the more rock oriented stuff great sense of great another question then from serena my student serena how many songs can you play i don't know right now uh, <laughs> i i know i know a lot of standards but uh, right now i don't really play a, a lot of jazz. I'm more on the, the composition side right now. But back in when I was really into jazz, I, I, I knew a lot of standards, of course, popular standards also. And uh, this P question from Peter is similar to a question I wanted to ask you is with the lines when you're playing the lines, is there a lot of studied lines or are you improvising everything? Like for example, in the Donna Lee solo, there's a line which is like this line. And you go, the one that goes that. Oh yeah. That one. Yeah, the, the quartal stuff, yeah. Yes, is that improvised or sometimes is it pre-prepared line? Uh, on that Donnelly solo, that quarter line was prepared. I didn't improvise that. <laughs> I, I, I just can't think of a complex line and play it. Of course, I have to learn it first. But uh, I, I think on, on the improvisation part, of course, I learned a lot of lines, but uh, I changed the rhythmic approach. Sometimes I start the line on the second beat, sometimes on the third, sometimes the first. So, it sounds more like I, I'm improvising, but I'm not. I think I'm 70% free learned lines, but 30% improvising. Right. On the fast stuff, because on a piece like Donnelly, you can't just improvise. You know, you, you have to prepare and study the, uh, the whole progression. Good. Oh, I'm glad you said that. Because when I learned that line, I was like, this is. <laughs> Oh, this is crazy. Okay, of course you you can improvise, but you have to study a lot only on that specific uh, idea. You know, I, I want to be able to improvise with quartal stuff. Yeah. You have to do a full immersion on that. So, did you do a lot of takes of Donnelly before you uploaded it? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I don't really remember how many takes I I, I got. N not so much because uh, um, I'm usually happy with the results. Uh, but sometimes I, there are some days where I just can't play and uh, I uh, kind of uh, fuck up some things. <laughs> <laughs> A few more questions from Pierre. Do you, do you play with the same people all the time or is it difficult to play regularly with other people? Um, right now I'm playing always with the same people, you know, because of the coronavirus <laughs> emergency. So I, I'm always play with my trio right now. Yeah. Um, but when I'm, when I'm at the music schools at the conservatory, I always try to play with different people uh, just for fun, you know, not, not just for learning. And do you produce your own music when you're in the studio? Yeah, I am independent, basically. Yeah, I produce my own music. Um, Serena said, can you see me? No, we can't see you, Serena. Uh, 
Have you spent a lot of time developing your tone? Tone, yeah. Um, uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, what everyone says is tone is in the fingers, and that's partially true. I think that you know, eighty percent of your tone comes from your technique. Your how how many hours do you put on the instrument, and uh, how how much control do you have on the instrument? Tone is basically that. But if you have a bad tone, like if you are plugging into a, an amp that you don't like, uh, it's it's gonna be counterproductive, I think, because uh, um, you, you are not used to. I, I just can't play with a bad sound. I, I I don't. If I'm playing guitar with a sound that I don't like, I just quit. I so it's important to always play with a sound that you like, so you can be inspired with your instrument. Great answer. Really good. That settles the age-old debate of tone versus. Is it in the fingers? Is it in the gear? It's in both, of course. <laughs> I think it's both, yeah. And what composers inspire you? It's a question from Peter. Yeah, I, I think one of the composers that I like, I, I, I really love Pat Metini. Say, say again, closer. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so talking about composing, the, one of the composers that I love the most is for sure Pat Metini. Ah, oh. uh, Pat is a as a huge influence on me, of course. And basically, maybe w one of my favorite players, uh, compositional wise, from from a composition perspective. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of bands from uh, you know fusion bands from the eighties, like uh, Yellow Jacket, Tribal Tech, Chikoria Electric Band. Like I really. Uh, like this kind of uh, stuff, especially the Chikora Electric Band. There are some compositions that I really love. Um, yeah, so basically, I am on the always on the Jets Fusion side. Uh, I I'm interested in learning more of uh, classical music uh, because you, you know classical composers <laughs> uh, from uh, our our harmonic perspective are really interesting so i i wanted to listen like more of a, like not not the traditional composers like bach mozart beethoven but the more modern ones like ravel um, and other ones i i you know i want to i i don't really know too much of classical music but i want to go in deep with that Yes. Someone asked there, do you know Antonio Forcione? Very um, good guitarist and composer. Forcione? I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, maybe if, if he's with the C, he's uh, Antonio Forcione. Yes. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is your preferred string gauge for electric from Mark? Uh, I always use stands. Yeah. These ones are stands. Um, I, I sometimes use 12 for the light, uh, uh, how do you call the jet strings? Um, flat wound? Flat wounds, yeah. I use very big flat wounds on the other rep stars. Yeah. Like they're 12, yeah. So uh, just, we've got a couple more questions and then we're gonna hear another piece from Matteo, an original this time. So just before we do that, I wanted to tell you guys about a course coming up that we're running. It's a live stream course on modes. It's called the learn four modes in four weeks. It's for to take your modal playing if you want to get better at playing Dorian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, and uh, Lydian, those four modes. If you want to do that, we have a course starting on the 27th of August and that's Thursday, the 27th of August, it's 8 p.m. Irish time, one hour per week for four weeks. So that's 100 euro, that course, but I'm gonna put a link to it in the description. And we've got a gift voucher. It's the word Mateo. You can use that for the gift. You get 20 euro off the course. So here's the link and the 
gift code is Mateo, all small letters like that. So a couple more questions in, and then we'll hear another piece and uh, say good evening to Mateo. This has been amazing, by the way, Mateo. This is blowing many of our minds completely open. So Pham clarified what he meant before. He says, when, when you're playing with the bass technique and your thumb can bend backward and rest on the humbucker and touch the E string so you can mute the string. So is, did you practice that or were you just able to do that? Uh, I'm, it wasn't really, I wasn't really, really aware of, of that when I started. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's just a comfortable position for me. I don't really need to hold, uh, to, I don't really need to mute the last string, the sixth string. Right. That's because I hold my thumb here. If you, are, you look closely on the guitar, there is a thumb rest here. Can you see it? Oh, interesting. Yes, yeah. the thumb rest. The, 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 that I use most of the time when I'm playing like that. That's a cool feature. Was that your idea to add that feature? Yeah, yeah, I, I added it, yes. Oh, very nice. I have to work on a little bit because it can be better. Um, but it's comfortable right now for me. So yeah, that's basically the idea. Fantastic. And last question, can you play any other instruments uh, no. <laughs> like guitar, no. Okay. Uh, if you want to get really good at the guitar, just play. play the guitar. Play the guitar. It's great. Thank you so much, Matteo. This has been absolutely brilliant. What? Tell us about the piece you're going to play. The last piece. Yeah, the, the piece is called the Polypano. It's actually a piece written uh, by, you know, inspiring. The, uh, from the Greek mythology, Polyphemo was a monster in the Greek mythology, and uh, this is a, a jazzy tune of my album, and uh, is in three four, so it's kind of a valzer thing, but a you know a, mo a more modern um, approach. Um, yeah, this this is Polyphemo. You hear the back track a lot. Or yes, for us, for us that was okay. That sounded okay there. Okay, I have to. And uh, just before you play, um, before you start, I'm gonna remind everybody one more time that I'll scroll up and I'll put this again in the chat. Mateo's PayPal. Here it is. Small or big, any donation is very welcome. Any amount. And uh, okay, let's start ready again. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Very beautiful. Great composition, amazing playing. So many people are saying, oh, beautiful tone, lovely, bravo, clap, clap, clap. Too bad we can't hear everyone. We actually could hear a proper round of applause. Fam is saying it's at 3 a.m. right now in Vietnam. He's very cool. thankful. That was really great, really amazing. Everybody tune into Guitar Night Live. We're gonna have another guest in September. The next guest is not announced yet, but it's going to be good. It's, if we confirm it, it's going to be a great guitar player. And uh, look out and you'll find out who it is. So again, thank you so much to Matteo. We learned so much. It's great to find out your approach to tone and practice and your learning songs. So many great things. We're really we're going to be talking about this one for a while. And uh, any anything else, last thing you want to mention or we we're gonna that piece is gonna be on your album that's gonna come out hopefully later this year yeah i hope uh i, I think by the end of december i it will be everything ready so uh, yeah I, I hope so so <laughs> well we're all looking out for it so uh see you next time on guitar night